for the worship Manasseh there on the Gittith. Ahimus David, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, whose glory is chanted above the heavens. Out of the mouths of children and suckling babies, you have founded a stronghold of praise to answer your enemies, to silence the opponent and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you created, what is man that you remember him, the son of man that you visit him? But you have made him little less than God, and crown him with glory and splendour. You make him Lord of the work of your hand. You have put all things under his feet, sheep and cattle, all of them, even the beasts of the wild, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, all that passes along the paths of the seas. Lord, our Adonai, Lord, Adonai, how majestic Adonai, is your name in all the earth. The, um, the 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 torch network is one of these things in the, in the um, in Oxford University where they have these interdisciplinary groups. I imagine they're the same kind of things in 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 Cambridge. But the 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 psalm network is is um, is something that that um, Sue set up, and it's it's just it was for me. It was actually the starting point for 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 doing this book. So it was actually a, a wonderful a wonderful thing. Wonderful when these networks are not only sort of. An academic conversation but are also generating new work and generating yes. creative work i think we have at a cambridge equivalent of, of torture which is rather alarmingly called crash but um <laughs> i've been involved in some of the interdisciplinary things between between theology and literature and mm -hmm. uh, also curiously enough psychogeography which has been quite interesting so some interesting things have come out of that well, the torch one is very much about looking at the Psalms in a multidisciplinary way. So poetry, music, art, um, we've had all sorts of medieval um, interpretations and certain, uh, therefore more literary. So, and yes, it's, it's multifaceted. So a bit, uh, a bit like Crash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, which is very much what this conversation is. So anyway, thank you for uh, joining us again um, for this conversation. As you'll know if you've been um, following them, the starting point for, for it was really the, the two books that um, uh, Malcolm and I both wrote during lockdown. His, his was um, David's Crown, which is 150 poems responding to the 150 Psalms. Uh, and mine was the uh, the Book of Praises, which is a, uh, a selection of the illustrated translations uh, of, of the Psalms that I've been doing over the years. Um, but today we're, uh, we're thrilled and honoured and just a little bit intimidated <laughs> to be joined by Professor Susan Gillingham, who is the, uh, the Oxford Professor of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and as you heard, uh, was very much instrumental in starting the, the Psalms uh, network uh, here in Oxford, but also has had a long standing research interest in the Psalms, uh, and in particular uh, in what's some called the reception history of the Psalms, the way the Psalms have been received and understood and interpreted in different cultures over the centuries. Um, and uh, this, is, this is one of our previous books, she's actually been writing a whole multi-volume um, series on interpreting this, uh, psalms. This is Psalms 1 and 2, and you can see, I just opened some of the uh, wonderful illustrations of the great history of the illuminated um, psalms, which um, is just one aspect of, of this amazing history. So, Sue, I wonder if perhaps you could, you could start by just telling us a little bit about how this, this kind of reception history enriches our understanding of Psalms, and, and particularly perhaps in, in relationship to, to Psalm 8, which we're, we're talking about today. I think it's easiest if I just centre on one particular thing, which is really the Jewish and Christian interpretations, i.e. the trajectories which both go in very different directions and occasionally um, come, come together, and that can be whether it's in commentary 
or in um, much later in Jewish tradition, of course, in music and art. But certainly, um, as far as Psalm 8 goes, what is fascinating about this particular psalm is that <laughs> Jewish readings have almost steadfastly seen it as a psalm about creation, which is what it seems to be at first sight. It really is about, you know, God who created the starry heavens and humans and animals and so on. Um, what you have um, in Christian tradition is it becomes a psalm about, quote, salvation or redemption. And it's because of the way two or three of the verses have been interpreted first by the New Testament and then by the early fathers and then the medieval age and then done uh, illuminations in manuscripts and then music. And so there's a whole tradition whereby we assume that what is man and the son of man that thou visits him is actually about Christ rather than about each of us with our place in creation as we read in Genesis 1. So that's where um, reception history sort of gives us a sense of the multivalency of a psalm and it's very diff di way, different ways you can tease it out depending upon what method you're using and what tradition you're coming from. Mm -hmm. It's actually Malcolm. I mean, you start in your poem with talking about the resurrection, don't you? I noticed. Well, that? yeah, that's also <laughs> partly because of the corona form that I chose for all the poems, whereby the last line of the previous poem is the first line of the next poem, and so I had, as it were, mentioned the resurrection at the very end of the last poem. But I was conscious of just this very thing that Susan has talked about, which is this tension between the original Jewish setting in the psalm and the particular ways, the, I mean, obviously the psalms have a messianic context in the content in the Jewish context as well, but there was a particular way Christians interpreted that with their understanding that the Messiah was in fact Jesus of Nazareth. And obviously there was special applications. And I was obviously writing these poems as a Christian priest. So on the one hand, I was reading reading them through that New Testament and early church lens. And I had Augustine's commentaries on the Psalms, for example, in my mind as well. But I also loved and resonated with the, um, the creation element in this. And mm -hmm. I would have sort of linked Psalm 8 in my mind with Psalm 19 as well. And um, so in fact, I thought that the repeated line was sufficient to just to glance at that particular Christological interpretation. Mm. And then in the rest of the poem, I really looked at the idea that paying attention to nature itself was a way of discerning or listening to the activity of God. And the other thing, of course, that I love in that, uh, you know, the famous line in Coverdale's translation, you know, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, mm. that ordained wisdom. So um, the poem became really about looking for a glimmering of light from God in places you might not expect. Yes, up in the starry heavens and out, mm. of the, but mm. also in infants. And I added the elderly as well. I was looking at this idea of God speaking in myriad voices from myriad places and yet being the one God. Mm. Interesting you chose to, that the last verse of, of one poem, the, the last part of one poem begins the beginning of the other, because this is, Psalm 8 couldn't be more apt because it, the, Psalm 7 ends with, I'll praise to the, and the name of the Lord, the Most High. And Psalm 8 is exactly that hymn of praise, which, the, which we're, we're anticipating. And Psalm yeah. 9 begins, I'll give thanks, you know, to the Lord in the whole heart and praise the name of the God. So Psalm 8 comes yeah. really neatly. Well, that's very good. Yes, I noticed that when I was <clears throat> doing, I mean, one of the, I, mean, I chose this form, which John Dunn had originally used in a little set called La Corona. And it's a corona in the sense that because the last line of one is the first yes, line, of the next, yes. then the final line of the last one is the first line of the first. Yeah. So it's a corona. And obviously I chose that because we were in the corona crisis. But the other thing I the reason why I chose it is that reciting the Psalms as they're given in the in the prayer book translation that I was using at Coverdale, they're allotted to certain days and you recite them in the offices. And sometimes the connections are wonderful and lucid and you can see why you've moved from one psalm to another. And sometimes the connections are just jolting and, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I felt the spiritual exercise was as much to be found in wrestling with the transitions from one psalm to another yes, as yes. they were in considering the psalms individually. And so yes. I wanted to make my sequence very much about the transitions. Yes, and if we're talking about Psalm 8 again, it's really interesting to see how you have this alternation of an, a morning psalm, evening psalm, morning psalm, evening psalm, working from Psalms 3 to 7. 
and then ending with day by day, I give you thanks, and then Psalm 8 is the evening psalm. You know, it's the, it, you're giving yeah. this to God who made the stars. And then it stops, right. the sequence stops. So there's a really interesting sort of um, build up as you get to Psalm 8 within the way the Psalms and the Psalter are brought together. Yeah, I mean, in the in the original Coverdale Psalter, as it was then set in the Book of Common Prayer, you're still on day one because you do quite a few and it's the evening. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, for the uh, good old days where you got through the Psalter in a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, no, I'm doing it at the moment. I mean, I... I mean, it does have this lovely. I mean, Malcolm was talking about this this sort of um, verse about the the infants and the the sort of suckling babies, of, which is an extraordinary verse, really. I mean, you don't know quite what that's where that's sort of coming from, but obviously that is the verse that actually Jesus quotes in the in the New Testament. When I just love this bit of the story, and when the I hadn't always noticed it when that he's coming into Jerusalem and the children seem to have followed him into the temple and are sort of shouting Hosanna, the son of David, and the, uh, you know, the temple authorities try and quiet them. And he, he quotes this verse about the, you know, from the lips of children, you've ordained praise. And it's, it's just this wonderful connection, isn't it, between the heavens and, you know, the tiny children and things, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, in my illustration that I used very much, I had in mind the, um, I think it was Newton who talks about himself as um, when it just before he died, he said that he was like, a, he often thought of himself as a little boy playing on the seashore, just picking up a, a, the, a, a, the most beautiful shell while the whole ocean of God's truth lay undiscovered before him. And, so and in that, fact, that was a quotation from Augustine. Augustine says that. that so I didn't know that. I didn't know that. that. When, when a single person tries to conceive the mind of God, they're like a child playing on the shore. Is that right? And and it's it's picked up again by Wordsworth in you know uh, the the intimations of immortality. Though inland far we be, our hearts yeah, have yes. yes, it's interesting. It's used in 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 the Palm Sunday um, episode. Is it's the psalm is all about in the psalm itself. It's all about how the weak confound the strong. You know the voices of children yes, yes. and the and the vulnerable. You know they are, then you have the silence of the enemy and the avenger. So you have the noisy religious leaders of opposition to Jesus and the simple innocent praise of the children who really don't really know all that it's about, but certainly do it in good faith. And I think yeah. that's why the psalm is so poignant. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and it should wait to the idea that if they tried to silence the children, the stones themselves would cry yes. out, which yes. is again the yes. kind of, I think it's just the stones of the temple. I think it's all, it's, mm. it's all the voice mm. of nature itself speaking. Yeah. There's some lovely um, illuminated psalters, particularly Byzantine ones, where you have next to Psalm 8, the actual um, entry into, into Jerusalem. They have Jesus riding on the donkey. And it's actually, that's, that is the illustration for this psalm. It's read entirely through that lens. Yeah. Theodore yeah. Salt, which is in the British Museum, for example, has got it. <laughs> British Library, sorry, not British Museum, British yeah. Library. Yes, yeah, yeah. one could do a whole exhibition, really, couldn't you? Of, of sort of these oh, yes, yes. Which would be, um, well, maybe in future days, there'll be something. <laughs> I mean, your book is actually rather much like that. And, um, uh, and it's got, as I said, these wonderful illustrations of the, of the sort of psalms in that. I is that true of the, the, the new volume as well? You, you yes, I've, it's, it. I've done a volume on all what Psalms 1 to 72, and then another one is in process of being done by, I finished it, by Wiley Blackwell on 73 to 151. Because, of course, the Greek salt has got 151 psalms, so I was trying to deal with the Greek uh, translation as well. Um, and yeah, in the middle there are thirty color plates, and in the uh, in the commentary about uh, twenty black, and, thirty black and white images. So it's it's illustrated with bits of music in as well, and loads and loads of websites, which obviously will soon go out of date. But you know, with films and music and art and so on that you can just access if you've got the digital copy. Well, again, it's this sort of wonderful interdisciplinary thing, and I think maybe this would be a good time for Malcolm to to read um, uh, his his poem, but. Um, before we before we do that, let me just say that we're going to. Uh, Malcolm was talking about sort of Psalm nineteen, and um, uh, we're going to be continuing these uh, conversations. Um, and I think the next person we're going to be talking to is um, going to California and talking to Professor David Taylor uh, about um, Psalm nineteen, uh, which I mean I always think is the just the, the perhaps the greatest poem in the in the Psalter. I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, 
But anyway, if you want to, and hopefully we may come back and talk to Sue about some of the, the later Psalms as well, because this is going to be a continuing um, series. Um, and if you want to, to follow it, do just um, click the red subscribe thing and then that'll let you know when, the, um, when we're doing the next one. Um, but uh, anyway, Malcolm, perhaps you would um, read us um, yes. your, so, your... As I think we said before, these, these poems are not, they're not like, you know, Philip and Mary Sidney's versions of the Psalms. They're not meant to be translations, but they're... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Poetic responses in prayer to something in the psalm that, psalm that stimulated me. So, Domine, Domine, Nostra, Psalm 8. Before the splendour of the resurrection dawns and transforms the world, I'll watch the lights of heaven, each a glory in their station, harbingers of heaven, keeping nights of watch with us, the moving moon and stars, his handiwork in which he still delights. And I will listen too. open my ears to every creature that still speaks his name, from babes and sucklings to those crowned with years, for wisdom laughs and lives in both. The flame of love is kindled round the world in old and young. I'll seek him too, beyond the tame familiar world, out in the wide and wild, as much in the steep seas and mountain heights as in the startling wisdom of a child.